Come sip sip you want to. A taste of local tradition. Trade Kings. Improve. Help stop the spread of COVID-19 by avoiding unnecessary movements. Did you know that with Madison General Insurance Company Zambia Limited, you can buy insurance from the cover of your home, office, or anywhere in the world in five easy steps? Step one, visit online.madison.co.zm and select the product of your choice. Step two, under motor insurance, select get a quote. Step three, enter vehicle details and validate your KYC with a one-time password to proceed. Step four, make payment using mobile money, bank transfer, visa or MasterCard. Step five, print your certificate of insurance on standard white A4 paper. It's that easy. But wait, there's more. Thanks to Mgen's integration with the Ratsa online system on buying your insurance from Mgen, your insurance details are instantly uploaded to the Ratsa system, enabling you to buy road tax immediately. Madison General Insurance Company, Zambia Limited, your award-winning digital insurance provider. Avoid unnecessary movements. Buy insurance online. Mgen, it's worth it. It's all about music, marriage, and Morgan Freeman this month. Atlanta's rap elite return with more dramatic ups and downs as they navigate the hip hop biz. I'm always gonna have your back. Lakshmi's life takes an unexpected turn when she learns the truth about her marriage. I promise, promise. And it's Morgan Freeman mania with a whole month of his blockbuster movies. If you would be Freeman, then you must fight. Get the latest and greatest with Go TV. Love it. Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited. Good evening. The whole of last week, the big news and the big story for Zambia was the 1.3 billion US dollar bailout package. Zambia, obviously in debt stress, and it being the first African country to default in uh, its loan repayment post COVID, the country has obviously been given a lifeline in the books of some and uh, this is in order for it to become sustainable to pay back its 14.6 billion dollars external loan and also the 89 billion kwacha local debt now in life people do wonder whether one has the right medicine or killing themselves slowly the imf bailout good or bad for zambia that is what we discuss this evening we take a short break i'll be introducing my guest right after this Good evening, thank you so much for joining us this evening on Costa. My name is Costa Monster. Remember, you're catching us exclusively live on the Airtel TV app as well as on DSTV, GoTV and Top Star. Now, my guest this evening is Director of Research at the Institute on Race, Power and Political Economy at the New School of New York City. He's been there since 2020. He's an economist, Dr. Grieve Chelwa. Good evening and welcome to Costa. Costa, it's an incredible honor for me to be on your program. I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we've extended an invitation to you to discuss this $1.3 billion you know, IMF lifeline based on an article you had published last week. And I'll just read brief excerpts of it. Um, you say in this article that the conditions of this IMF you know, deal for you are incredible, unbelievable, heartless and basically make for very sad reading. Let's start from there. Mr. Mansa, mm. I think 
the basis, by the way, thanks for reading that article, and I think it's gone around much, gone around much <coughs> faster and wider than I had anticipated. Mm. I mean, the basis for me arriving at that conclusion is essentially when I read the document that the IMF published on Wednesday, or is it Tuesday, and one so sees in that document that the conditions are going to be quite drastic, essentially centered around reducing government expenditure quite drastically at a time, as you can imagine, when I think we should be doing the reverse, given what's happened over the last 10 years, what's happened with COVID. That's the essence of the, uh, the basis of that conclusion, and I imagine we have a lot more to talk about there to unpack that. Many obviously would disagree with you. This news, obviously, for those in government, uh, for you know, sympathizers and praise singers of the current administration, uh, definitely do not love the taste of, of, of this article. But they say the devil is in the detail. Um, this week ended, a 135-page report uh, was released for us to know because it was all about, yes, we've been given $1.3 billion, but what is the devil in the detail? And among the key things that you, you, you really look at, you say the centerpiece of the deal is that the IMF is targeting, in their words, a large front-loaded and sustained fiscal consolidation. Specifically, they want the fiscal deficit to decline from 6% of GDP in 2021 to a surplus of 3.2% of GDP by 2025. Do you this, see this being achieved? And obviously, we'll break it down because conditions attached to it obviously are surrounding subsidies. But let's start from the issues of this fiscal consolidation and you know the GDP decline. So the question is, do I see the government achieving this? Mm. And that's, I think, the, is it the $1.3 billion question or is it the $14 billion <laughs> question or whatever the size of the debt is? It's going to be very tricky. In fact, when you read the IMF's own report, they do write in there that they are also concerned about some of the political, what they call political economy, political ramifications of uh, such a large front-loaded adjustment, fiscal adjustment. So they too are worried because often when you inflict this amount of pain on people, they might, the government somewhere down the line, because they're also human beings, you know, they are custodians, uh, they have, you know, lots of respect for the president, they might, in the middle of it, uh, reverse course because it's quite painful. But that is why essentially the IMF wants to monitor them very closely. There's a six monthly appraisal process. There are benchmarks, what they call structural benchmarks, which the government has to um, uh, meet. So essentially the IMF has come in as our caretaker and they're going to make sure that uh, uh, come push or shove, we meet that large fiscal adjustment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The president on Friday obviously addressed the nation through parliament. He was opening the current session of the National Assembly. He kept on emphasizing in his speech, you know, Dr. Chilwa, that um, for him, this is a Zambian homegrown program and people who are saying this is a foreign, you know, led thing. So when you say the IMF will closely monitor and supervise, uh, I think we're trying to run away from that. And there's also this comparison that the IMF of the 90s is very different from the IMF of you know, the 2000s or the or is it the 21st century? Do you agree with that? Is this a locally homegrown driven process? How far can the IMF stick their fingers into our issues despite this being alone? It is surprising the extent to which that document that was released on Tuesday is essentially uh, a signaling that these guys in Washington mm. will be watching us very closely, right? And about the plan being homegrown, I've studied the IMF for many years mm. as an economist, and it's got their fingerprints. The IMF's policy solutions are always drastic fiscal adjustment of the type that they're prescribing to us. This has got their fingerprints on it. There's nothing homegrown about this particular recovery plan, Mr. Mr. So Monson. when you say it's got their fingerprints on it, I think the interest for many citizens is who calls the shots? It's quite clear. It's the IMF. I mean, I invite... Uh, viewers, I invite citizens to read that report. Read that report and I come back and make the conclusion that this is really us driving this car. This car is being driven by the IMF and we're sitting in the passenger side, perhaps even sitting in the back seat. Reading the report, many Zambians will not. We've got, obviously, um, the lack of access, but the poor reading culture, and, and hence this, this evening's discussion that through you, people can be educated. L let, let's start from somewhere where, I mean, just yesterday, um, a driver was asking me, sir, what does this 1.3 billion IMF mean 
for me, how will it help us? What does it mean for Zambia? Uh, uh, are we going to be, I mean, social media, there's, there's, there's a lot of fun by citizens Zangena and things like that. Let's try to summarize and break it down, really. What is this $1.3 billion? How will it be given to us? What are, are the conditions? What does it mean for our economy? I think let's, let's start from there in, in, in some summary nutshell. Yes, I was going to say if we have uh, how many hours we have. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, we have a debt problem, right? A large debt problem, somewhere between 14 and $17 billion external debt. Uh, and we need to restructure that debt, which is to say we need to talk to the people we owe money and find a solution to figure out how to pay that debt. So essentially what the government has done is they're using the IMF as a tool to allow for proper debt negotiations or at least to set in motion a process for debt restructuring. So that $1.3 billion is the money that the IMF is going to give us over 38 months uh, as assist, balance of payments assistance. But it's small, as you can imagine, relative to what we owe. In mm. fact, it doesn't, come, it doesn't come to us in one fell swoop. It comes, uh, you know, we meet some conditions, they'll release another chunk. I think the first payment to Zangena was $185 million mm. came in this week, last week that is, uh, and some will be trickling in just like that as we meet the conditions. So it's a small amount, <coughs> and essentially it's $1.3 billion because that's the n countries that are members of the IMF are lent in proportion to their quota, to their shareholding. So a shareholding as Zambia allows us a maximum of $1.3 billion. We're such an insignificant country in the wider scheme of things. So that's what this deal is about. Uh, what does it mean for Zambia? It means many things. And the important thing, Mr. Mansa, to realize is what does it mean for whom? Often in this country we have debates about economic policy where we speak in very vague terms. The country will benefit. I ought to ask a second order question, who in the country is going to benefit? Who in the country is going to carry the burden? And when I've done the analysis, Mr. Mwansa, based on the reading of this deal, the reading of many other deals across history, uh, often the poor, and it's quite clear in this deal, the poor are the ones who are going to share in the larger, take the larger burden of the, of the pain. And uh, the well-off might uh, actually do very well uh, at the end of it all. So, I mean, this, this is very interesting, but again makes for sad and bitter hearing or, or reading for many Zambians because the current, you know, administration on the backdrop of the August 2021 election, people had placed their hopes in them in that the cost of commodities and the cost of living was too high. Um, again, referring back to the president's speech on Friday, he opened with a comparative of, you know, certain, you know, micro indicators from the exchange rate to, to inflation and so on. But I think what is important, and, and when you go around the streets, it's the it's, it's basic cost of living, things like the petrol, millimeter and so on. But already, when, when you break down this, and I'll read again, you're saying basically the IMF wants our government to reduce expenditure in the billions of dollars between now and 2025. You say, this, my friends, is the definition of austerity. How is this reduction of the fiscal deficit going to be achieved by reducing expenditure on the following? One, let's talk about fuel subsidies. What, are you, what do you see when you read this report? Essentially, and what's very interesting is they're putting dates, the IMF is putting dates when certain things should have been done. Mm. Again, going back to that homegrown question, right? Why not in the driver's seat here? So the IMF wants by the end of September 2022, this month, all subsidies on fuel should have been removed. Uh, we had suspended, in January 2021, we had suspended excise duty and VAT on, uh, on fuel, which are called implicit subsidies. We had removed explicit subsidies some while back. The IMF wants those subsidies to go. In other words, they want the excise duty to come back on fuel and the VAT as well. So, and you, I think a circular was shared on social media. We've seen that Exactly. So this is going to push up the price of fuel. Essentially, I, I, I need you to be very thorough on that because um, the last two months, uh, or let me just say, with the new fuel pricing structure on a monthly basis, citizens have been keenly following this because it affects their bus fares and, mm -hmm. and marketeers, traders, mm -hmm. school-going kids. Everybody mm -hmm. jumps on a bus or is using petrol or diesel. And uh, we are still not in a very comfortable position price-wise. Mm -hmm. Will this IMF deal put petrol and diesel prices down? No. I mean, if we're going to add excise taxes and add VAT at the month of September, it's going to push up the price of petrol. Now, if we're so lucky that something, you know, God is kind to us 
and the price of crude on international markets goes down <coughs> quite significantly, that might also imply that we benefit in a certain way. But it's highly unlikely that we can, we'll go back to what the petrol price used to be, you know, some time back, you know. Um, now, the issue is countries, why do we have governments? Governments are there in many ways to be the embodiment of our aspirations. And also, I think in Zambia, our aspirations are always, are always around about looking after the less well-off. And governments ought to protect their people from the vagaries of changes and shocks in international markets. The IMF wants the Zambian government to have nothing to do with petrol pricing, with energy pricing. The argument obviously would be with this current debt stress and exposure, is it tenable for government to subsidize at the moment? It is very tenable. And uh, I think what's also very interesting is that when one reads that particular report that came from the IMF, it's quite clear, again, it's quite clear on who is carrying the burden of austerity, the burden of restructuring. It is the poor, right? The corporate types, the corporate uh, companies, the mining houses are essentially getting away with, uh, with, uh, with having, no, having to not share in any part of this burden. So essentially, that is what economic policy making is about. For whom? Is the burden going, who's going to carry the burden, who is going to be uh, better off at the end of it all. And essentially what the IMF has always done historically, it is always to punish the poor and advantage the corporate types. The corporate types are not sharing in this particular burden. Why is it that the poor should be the ones to restructure? We should increase corporate income taxes. We should increase uh, taxes on the mines. We should increase taxes on all those companies that are doing very well, the banks, the telecoms, so as to pay for those who are less well off. We've made a deliberate choice. And economic policy making, I want the viewers to understand, is not necessarily a science. Often it's informed by ideology. We've made a choice in this country to advantage the corporate types and to disadvantage the poor. That was a deliberate choice. We could have made a different choice. Well, obviously, in, in the last couple of months, uh, uh, cycles around the pricing of petrol have been triggered. One, you've mentioned the international or you know, market price, but secondly, our exchange rate, which kept fluctuating, do you see it stabilizing? The president, again, I'll keep on referring to his speech, uh, in this, within the, I mean, probably the short or long term, spoke about restructuring of, of, of Indeni. But for me, I worry, because, you know, petrol, diesel, these are important aspects of the, of the cost of doing business and production. If fuel prices are high, the price of commodities go high. So where do we see us sitting in the immediate and short term? I mean, that's an important question. Like you, Costa, I worry. Energy is such a vital input into everything. Everything that we do is really buttressed by energy. Mm. And, and fuel is one of the most, I mean, it's even called fuel. We have expressions in English that says to fuel the process, mm. it means to kickstart the process. So fuel is such a vital ingredient. And Western countries spend a lot of time making sure that they can stabilize the price of fuel because they recognize just how devastating it can be on the economy, on the poor, on production. As we are speaking now, you must have followed the, uh, the, pro uh, the proceedings around a new prime minister in Britain. In, in the UK. In the UK. <coughs> and you saw what she's promising there. The first thing are tax cuts. Yeah, tax cuts, fuel yeah. relief, uh, you know, relief for households that are facing high energy prices. That is what governments do. And um, uh, so I'm worried, Mr. Mas. I'm incredibly worried. Yeah. And uh, if government completely divorces itself from managing the price of fuel, it means that the price of fuel will move according to market dynamics, which they have very little control over. Price of crude, the exchange rate, you know, what happens if our culture depreciates drastically? Will government just watch as that depreciation is passed on into higher energy prices to the poor? I'm worried, just mm. like you. One of the most puzzling things that um, I've always, you know, tried to get solid explanation and answers from you economic experts is this you know dichotomy of we, we we are in an economy where inflation keeps reducing we are boasting of this single digit inflation while the entire globe is in recession and inflation in in many countries better than us economically is high uh, in europe in the west where you're sitting but also that this inflation Dr. Chelwa, cannot reflect on the people's, you know, dining tables or the people's kitchen tables. So how do we explain the fact that we are the second best performing currency in the world, we've got single digit inflation, but it's not translating. Can the citizens feel it, the poor? 
Uh, no, and I'm with you. Uh, because remember that inflation is really, uh, the inflation rate is the rate at which prices are increasing. So what has happened is that that rate has slowed down, but prices are still increasing, right? I mean, we're grateful that the rate has slowed down <coughs> because it could have been worse had it continued, uh, prices continued growing at 20% or thereabouts. Mm. Uh, so essentially, the citizens are not going to feel it uh, quite yet, precisely because prices are still growing. What we do need is that that inflation rate should continue, the rate of increase should continue declining, you know, come to somewhere between, I think the government has a target of 6 to 8%, around about there, and if it is sustained over a period of months or years, then citizens will feel the benefit. So we're in the right direction there, and I, I'd like to uh, say, you know, they say shout out, people at the central bank have been doing very good work in trying to at least maintain a stable currency, which then translates into a declining inflation rate. Uh, but also they were very lucky. One of the things that happened to President Hichilema's government, luck, was that when, uh, when he was sworn in, the IMF gave what we call special drawing rights <coughs> to all countries in the world because of COVID. I think we got about $1.3 billion or thereabouts. Uh, part of that has been spent on, uh, on uh, buttressing our foreign reserves in the central bank, which helps stabilize the foreign currency. Part of it has also been spent on... Um, you know, social cash transfer, part of it might have, half of it actually has been spent on the 2022 budget. So it helped finance the 2022 budget. Luck, luck as it were. And again, it's also a nice example of when the IMF gives money to a country and gives it to them with no strings attached, as they did with the special drawing rights in August of 2021, our government spent it on the things that we care about. So it is not the case that the Hichilama administration is anti-poor. We have evidence that they spent the special drawing rights, they spent it on good things, hiring teachers, hiring health workers, you know, social cash transfer, and stabilizing our currency. It is when the IMF gives you money with strings attached that forces you to do those things that you truly believe in. I believe President Hichlema believes in social spending. He believes in health care, education, spending on the poor, protecting the poor, but his hands are tied. But what, we, what we hear agreement. now with this, you know, loan is that we will use it towards budget support and, again, strengthening international reserves. Is this the area where we should be plowing this law? Uh, again, Mr. Monsa, it's important to understand what the government is using the loan for. The loan itself is a drop in the ocean. <coughs> Our ocean of debt is huge. But, and this is a part I disagree with, the government is hoping that by getting this loan, it is like by passing grade 7 or passing grade 12, uh, Mr. Monsa can hire you a Diamond TV. So we're using this, obtaining the loan was like an exam. So we passed. Because we have expassed, maybe we many in Congo, the people we owe money to might be able to listen with, to us, might be able to talk with us. I certainly disagree. I think we should have gone and talked to them ourselves directly. Mm. Uh, and we have a lot of experts in this country. Our own president is an expert in finance. I think a team should have been constituted pretty early on uh, not leaving it to Ministry of Finance alone, I have a lot of respect for Ministry of Finance, but a committee of experts comprising of folks in government, as well as folks in private sector, folks in academia, folks in civil society, the church, we should have constituted a team of experts uh, to go and talk to our creditors on a case-by-case -case basis. But the picture painted is that we could not have unlocked this debt scenario without the IMF giving us this you know, guarantee, in a way the lenders, the bondholders, China, and everybody decided to come to the table and listen to us only because the IMF is guaranteeing this. That's not true. In fact, it's the jury is still out whether this particular agreement is going to unlock that debt restructuring. Once you read the convoluted uh, <laughs> procedures and processes around debt restructuring, it's actually very tricky. In fact, we've got what is called the G20 Common Framework, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which, which sets up a committee of bilateral uh, uh, creditors, so people who we owe money to who are governments. Right? Those people are seemingly wanting to talk with us, but still that's not very clear. And this IMF deal is not a guarantee that they will talk to us. They might very well talk to us. But again, that's a small chunk of the debt that we owe. If you remove China from that club, the rest is minuscule. The folks we actually owe money to are the bondholders, the commercial banks, and China. And what I have argued is that we should have constituted our own committee of experts, local experts, Zambians both domestic and abroad. We've got the expertise, Mr. Mwansa. We've been training people since 1966 at the University of Zambia. We're 58 years old. 
we've got what it takes to constitute a team. The president should have done that pretty early on and sent this team on a mission to China. If you recall, China joined this G20 framework creditor committee very late. It's very late, and that wasted our time. We should have gone to China pretty quickly, spoken to China, understand what they want, their preferences, their tolerance for helping us out in restructuring. We shouldn't have gone to the bondholders, meet the bondholders that dispersed around the world, meet them, meet the private commercial lenders, and then also maybe these bilateral guys. Where are the bottlenecks, or where do you see the sticky points? One would argue, for example, that uh, China, who we are owing just slightly under six you know, billion U.S. dollars, um, and averagely they are the largest lender in the world, uh, they are very strategic with their lending. So maybe they might be the easier to even talk to because China has an agenda uh, of where they position themselves in the world. Who or where are the sticky bottlenecks in this whole debt puzzle? Is China the real big issue? That's an excellent question. That's an excellent question which this committee that should have been constituted was going to confront. Right? What are the different characteristics, strategies, interests of the different creditors? You've mentioned China. China, like you are saying, is a rising power. China is playing a geopolitical game. Right? Part of it is financial interests. Part of it is just influence in the world. Right? With, influence in the world comes, with influence in the world comes many things, as we have seen with the United States of America. So essentially, when one understands that, then one structures a particular conversation with that creditor. This is what this committee should have done. The bondholders, those guys are mostly driven by financial interests, right? Because they want their money back. They lend to this country, they want their money back. You have a certain kind of conversation with them. In fact, I suspect the bondholders are the ones who are particularly interested in those painful conditions. Are the we using part of this $185 you know, million, dollars, or just the chunk of this one point three? when we say budget support, to pay back this debt that we want to restructure because some of, you know, these um, benefits or, or, or economic uh, positive indicators that we've, we've experienced in the last one year owing to the fact that uh, our payment on, 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 on interest and penalties were suspended. Correct. So we need to paint a picture, Doc, of what will our resource envelope be looking like when all things be, being equal, we have to start paying monthly payments for the loans. Yeah, it's going to look terrible. And I think, uh, Mr. Mansa, I really appreciate the way you frame things. Uh, and I think part of the benefits in the exchange rate, appreciation and perhaps stability, might be attributable to what you said. We, you know, during COVID, <coughs> something called the G20 came up with something called debt suspension uh, initiative or something like debt service suspension initiative, DSSI. And that might have given us some breathing room. But like you are saying, when all things are put on the table, that is when, uh, uh, is it the expression, the, 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 the proof is in the pudding or whatever it is. That's mm -hmm. when the rubber hit, hits the road, right? And I think, again, we like to cast all these things as inevitable. We have to pay come what may. Right? All these are points of conversation, points of, of discussion. Remember, Mr. Mwansa, there are two sides to this coin of debt. Mm -hmm. There are two players when it comes to Nkongoli, the one who lent you the money and the one who borrowed. Why is it that in this particular moment, the the, the burden of paying, the burden of confronting this problem is squarely only being put on Zambia's shoulders. What about the people who lent us money? Where were they when they were lending money to the Patriotic Front government, which we now know uh, was not using these resources in a, in a very prudent way? <coughs> so surely they should also share in the pain, in the burden, in the restructuring. And this committee of experts that I wish the president had constituted should have gone with this mindset to say, well, nay, bondholders, you guys, not once, three times you gave money to the Patriotic Front government when it was pretty clear at that time that uh, they were a bit careless with where they were spending their money. But you kept on giving them money. So in trying to come up with a solution, we should both share in the burden. You'll give us some debt write-offs, some you'll do some uh, what they call a haircut, yeah. so we can meet halfway. This committee, had it been constituted very well, teamed up by Patriotic Zambians, well-versed uh, Zambians, Diverse enough in its makeup, I think we would have been in a different position to where we are do, today. Do we see any haircuts? I know that the, the, there's certain talk of some debt being written off, especially on the part of maybe you know China. But how far can we go in terms of getting haircuts? But also, probably the best thing that may have only come out is an extension in terms of the the repayment period. 
again, it's not very clear. And what I worry is about our conversations are happening under this G20 common framework. Mm -hmm. I find it to be a very limiting framework. It talks about equal treatment of all creditors. So, for example, China in this framework, because they have now joined this creditor committee, they might say, if you had talked to us alone, we would have been willing to write off big chunks of Now, we're talking as, you're talking to us with this team, mm -hmm. so why should China carry the biggest uh, burden of the haircuts, the biggest burdens of the restructuring or deferment? Also, France should do the same thing. You know, it becomes a geopolitical thing. This is why I wish we had gone to China, Beijing, talk to them, uh, human being to human being, person to person, have a conversation with them, have a de deliberation. You know, they were not too long ago were poor like us. They understand what it is to be poor. Appeal to that kind of thing to them. Who knows what kind of deal would have come out of it? But now I think we are straight jacketed by this common framework. Approach. Back to this, you know, IMF document. Um, it, it, I was looking uh, earlier today at um, the, the pie chart in terms of the consolidated, what they're calling the PPG, you know, debt that we're owing. Um, astonishingly, the figure that was in there was about thirty billion, you know, dollars, and you see that it's both bilateral, multilateral, and obviously private credit that's in there. Um, interestingly, there I want to pick out two point two billion dollars that Zesco is owing on import power you know, uh, uh, agreements. Now, I've picked this one out because, interestingly, part of this IMF deal is that electricity tariffs, tariffs rather, will have to increase via, you know, subsidy removal. And the IMF wants the Zambian government to publish a plan for doing this by December of this year. The cost of service study has just recently been published. Another proposal there of 17% that is being proposed. Again, you included this in, in your article, and you say this will cause pain among our people. So let, let's talk tariffs and electricity. Yeah, that's another big worry. Again, mm. this document from the IMF, the burden of restructuring of fiscal consolidation is on the poor, and that's another example, right? So it certainly is true that Zesco is in a bit of a financial crisis. Uh, part of it, and I think Dr. Mbita Chitala has written an excellent book on the problems that bedevil Zesco. Part of it has got to do with uh, the fact that, I, I don't know, I always forget whether it's Kafue Lower or Kafue Upper, I forget which one it is. But we have a new power station that has made us, I think once it comes on stream, if it hasn't already, it has made us largely uh, self-sufficient in power. And we'll have to export some of that power. So Zesco undertook this huge investment, right? Part of the debt is that. In my books, that is partly justifiable debt because we need to ramp up our ability to generate electricity, right? To power our industry, to deliver, to make sure that many of our people can be connected to the grid. The other part of it is what they're calling independent power producers, IPPs. These ones also we owe money to. Uh, and Dr. Mbita Shitala's book actually explains that some of those deals were between the IPPs and Zesco were not transparently done, were not above board. You know, he, I invite readers to read that book. So certainly, yes, Zesco is in a fiscal problem. So the IMF is recommending that we move our tariffs to become cost reflective, right? So we stop. And this has always been the argument. This has always been the argument. But again, Mr. Mas, as we have seen with events in Europe, you know, you don't subject your people to the vagaries of the market. Some commodities, some services are super essential mm. that they have to be provided free of charge, if not below cost, mm. because of their importance. Electricity is such an it's like the lifeblood. Mm. of our country, and we're about to now, hike it. I also want to make a one point on Zesco, Mr. Mas, if you allow me. Mm. You know, the one worry that people had was, is Zesco going to be privatized? Now, I read that report from the IMF, so it doesn't answer that question explicitly. However, there's a few sentences there that talks about divestment of Zesco's operating assets. So again, that worries me. You know, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Mm. I have no idea. It, essentially, divesting is selling of some assets. So again, uh, as Zambians, we have to be on the lookout to see essentially what this divestment means when the details are published. Zesco is such an important company. But there's been talk so often when we talk about restructuring Zesco that, you know, uh, issues of their salary bill is, is, is too high, but there were proposals of unbundling, you know, Zesco, having maybe an engineering or distribution department separate from what becomes their their commercial sales department, uh, could that be the case? Or purely this, this diversity, diversing is something 
absolutely different that the IMF is proposing? I, I mean, that's a good question. I have no idea, but it uh, divesting means sales, and we have to be really on the lookout as Zambians, because ESCO is such an important company. Company as equal, as people always like to call it. This is an important utility. Electricity is like national security. You cannot have uh, electricity in the hands of private sector. You can't. That has to be a thing that the Zambian people own themselves. And about Zesco paying higher salaries than usual, again, Dr. Chitala's book is very instructive in here. I've read his book, and he shows in the region, actually, Zesco does not pay salaries above uh, average. If, if anything, they are slightly below average. Zesco is not blotted. You always hear this example that Zesco is a very blotted. It is not. Actually, the majority of people who work for Zesco who, who are referred to as blotting Zesco are casual workers who are slashing, you know, underneath those Zesco pylons. So I think the issue is certainly Zesco has financing problems. We need to fix those problems uh, out, but we have to be careful how we do it. Yeah, when doing so. the, the larger bulk or chunk of our, our population, when you look at the economies of scale, you've got the lower income and the lower middle income, as we would call it. So the, 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 if we have to say the, the higher income are really in the minorities, when we put your analysis on, on first of all, subsidy removal or, or, or import waivers on, on, on fuel prices and you anticipate them to go high, you anticipate electricity you know, charges to go high, what, what does this mean for this lady you know, running a salon, for a, a, a youth you know, running a barbershop? What does it mean for a bus driver, a taxi driver? Literally the SME sector that we're saying has to grow and we need to create jobs because government won't employ Everybody. What does this mean for the SME sector? The, the outlook is grim. And again, I like Mr. Kos, Mr. Mansa, how you've put, contextualized this. This country is majority poor. About 60% of us are, of the country is poor. And that is when you use this uh, $1.80 per day, which is nothing. So if you include, increase it to about $3 per day, it is almost 80%. We're a poor country. We're a poor country, and because we're a poor country, it is important for economic policy to be based on that fact, on the fact that we're majority poor. And sadly, this uh, program doesn't do that. The program is catering, again, to that small minority that you spoke about. So it really means a, a disaster for this uh, lady who's trying to run a salon, mm. for this young man who's trying to drive a taxi. Uh, it really means, and then there's the knock-on effects. Remember, there will be second-order effects. If those things go up, Right? It means also other people's inputs of production goes up. So you might end up having a, you know, a vicious cycle. In fact, the IMF does say in that particular report that one of the risks, upside risks that they foresee, is inflation might again begin to rise. Because as these things begin to rise in prices. So really we are, we, we are gambling with this nation's future, mm. I think. What, 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 when you look at the fifth six all the way up to now the eighth national development plan one of the things that we've been saying as 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 a country is that we could be a breadbasket of 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 the continent the president again outlined this uh, in his speech to parliament on friday but sadly you you, you touch on the farmer input support program or fisp as we've known it um the imf is calling for its reforms um drastic cuts again let's break this down what are the emphasized cuts between now and 2025. You're right. So the Farmer Input Support Program, in my estimation, is one of this country's most successful policies that we've introduced in the last 20 years. The uh, Farmer Input Support <coughs> Program arrived in 2002, 2003, with Pres late President Levy Mwanawasa. Then it was called F Fertilizer Support Program, FSP. Mr. Monsayo and I are old enough to remember the 1990s, mm. when uh, maize was always in short supply in this country. You know, maize was in such a short supply, Mr. Mwasa, that we had the famous Carrington maize scandal. You remember it? And the yellow maize. That and the yellow maize that we <laughs> ate. Maize was such a big issue that we were once swindled because of trying to buy maize abroad. That has disappeared completely. We are now a net exporter of maize. We are self-sufficient in maize. What has changed? It is FISP. FISP is what has guaranteed our self-sufficiency in maize. And obviously, because it's a large program, and because it guarantees our self-sufficiency in maize, it is very costly to implement. And also there are inefficiencies, as happens with many large programs. The IMF wants us to reform. I've studied the IMF for a very long time, Mr. Mansa. Reform is language for cut. 
So they want us to, I think it costs about 3% of GDP now, they want it to come down drastically at 1%, if not less. Now they're arguing that no, uh, essentially it won't mean cuts, but it will mean we would have made it more cost efficient. I don't believe that. Actually, they want to reduce the number of beneficiaries that are on the FISP. This country's most successful uh, agriculture policy program in the last 20 years, which has made us self-sufficient in maize. And what is funny is that in this report, the IMF is praising us mm. for a self-sufficiency of maize, and yet they want us to kill the goose that's been laying our golden eggs. So how do we go about this? Because, I mean, for a long time, obviously, Doc, you've heard these arguments that people who've been benefiting from FISP have not been graduating with these peas and farmers. If I'm given input and fertilizer for free, I must be able to produce and, 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 and really graduate. Again, uh, the new Dawn administration is saying the way FISP has been done in the past has to be restructured, doing it much better. We heard of the e-voucher under the PF. So there are some who feel, when you describe it as successful, that it, this, this was a good initiative but executed poorly. I mean, that's true. Like, uh, like I kept, keep, keep on saying, Mr. Mansa, it's a large program. Like any large program, whether it is in Zambia, whether it is in America, mm. whether it is in Britain, large government programs tend to have inefficiencies because of their scale. And it is true we should improve them as we go along. But I don't buy for a second this, uh, <clears throat> the, this, debate, this debate that farmers should graduate. I think it is enough that they're producing our food. Now, those who want to graduate and become something else, perhaps they should do that. But that sh it should not be the number one objective of the program. The number one objective of the program should be full maize sufficiency. In the U.S. today, wheat farmers are subsidized to the hilt. To the hilt. The US, U.S. Department of Agriculture spends billions of dollars per year subsidizing wheat production. You know why? Because they want the U.S.A. to be sufficient on wheat. They don't want to have to rely on China on wheat. It's a national security issue. Food is an important issue. Nkani Zapamala is incredibly important. So, so, so right? here, then, here yeah. then is, you know, the question for me. Doc, you're sitting in New York and, and mingling with, you know, people with uh, sitting as G20 and so on. I, I often sometimes say they're not being sincere or they're being double-tongued. Why prescribe these conditionalities to Africa, to Zambia, while the same cannot be done for UK, cannot be done for US, cannot be done for Germany, or even Greece. Because even post, you know, COVID, certain economies have been allowed to borrow, and things we're being told should not happen in terms of tax cuts and so on, are exactly happening the opposite in these countries. You're right. I mean, uh, when Joe Biden uh, took on the presidency in the, U in the US in 20. I forget now, in 2021, in January. By March, he had passed what is called the American Recovery Act, Rescue Recovery Act, APA or something like that. A huge injection, the reverse of fiscal consolidation, fiscal expansion, because that is what you do when you are in a rut, when your economy is limping. You don't contract expenditure of government. If anything, you grow it because of the knock-on effect. And uh, you're right about the double standards. And I think there are many African scholars who have perhaps, and, and, and maybe rightfully so, uh, you know, theorize that maybe these folks don't want us to develop. Mm. They're trying to kick, it's uh, kicking away the ladder. The ladder that they used to develop, they're trying to kick it away, right? And I think uh, this is one conclusion one can arrive at. And this is why it's very important for us to be in the driving seat of whatever economic policies we're crafting, mm. right? There's a famous expression in Vietnam, apparently when the IMF gets into the car and they want to drive the car, the Vietnamese get out of the car. In Africa, when the IMF, in Zambia in particular, when the IMF gets into the car and want to drive the car, we move to the back seat and become passengers. Uh, when you talk about that different schools of thoughts, mm -hmm. I, I forget the gentleman, but I watched um, this one video analysis. I'm sure you've come across it of this, you know, one, you know, I think it's a politician from, from the United States who says that African countries will never, ever pay back debt, whether it's from the IMF or it's from, you know, other multilateral lending partners, because of the manner in which these debt, you know, agreements are structured. And one of the things he pointed out is that in order for African governments to come to the table, for example, with the IMF, to say, we're going to give you $1.3 billion, show how, through your balance of payments, you're going to pay this, the first thing African governments run to is increased taxes. And again, this is one thing you talk about in your article, value-added tax or VAT, as we know it, the IMF wants us to broaden 
our VAT base. And again, 16% average within the region, a bit too high. Mm -hmm. So higher petrol, higher electricity, more taxes for the people. It's crazy, Mr. Mansa. In fact, on the VAT, I was looking at the numbers. You know, they want us to grow our revenue, how much revenue the Zambia Revenue Authority collect by about 3% of GDP over the next three years. The bulk of that, 80% of that, will be on the VAT, from the VAT. Corporate income tax to the mines and non-mines is only going to be 15%. So the majority of the revenue increases, the IMF wants it to come from VAT. And VAT, Mr. Mwansa, in economics is what we call the most, one of the most regressive taxes because it impacts the poor more than anything else. That 16% on bread uh, for somebody who's living on very little is a lot for them versus 16% for me or you, Mr. Mansa, who are fortunate enough to be, uh, to be well off in this country. So this is what breaks my heart. I mean, I look at those numbers, it breaks my heart. So, so, so are you anticipating that when Minister Msoko Tuane this month and presents the 2023 budget, they might, because of this IMF recommendation, be pushing up what is currently sitting at 16% to probably more to accommodate this agreement? Uh, am I expecting, I am more than confident because it is a structural benchmark. If you read that report that came from the IMF, it is, it is like a teacher who has given the student some, uh, some milestones. Mm. It is a milestone. Some instructions. That Mr. Yeah, exactly. Mr. Uh, Dr. Msoko Twani has to meet that particular structural benchmark. Now, is he going to increase the VAT? That question is still, uh, the jury is still out. But they're going to have to remove the, the lots of goods and services that are exempted from VAT, that are zero rated for VAT, precisely because governments know that VAT ha hits the poor. Mm. So they're going to remove a lot of exemptions from those goods and services, add the VAT back to them, just like they have done for fuel, which effectively translates into an increase in the VAT. So Dr. Msokotwani has no choice here. Again, the mm. question, who is driving this car? Who is driving this car? I just want to read this for the sake of the viewers tonight to, to really appreciate and just jog your, your thoughts on what you had written. You say, the IMF wants us to broaden our VAT base, which essentially means limiting the number of goods that are VAT exempt. The VAT is one of the most regressive taxes in the world because it impacts the poor much more than the well-off, like you've rightfully put it. Now, because of this, governments often exempt many products from VAT to protect the poor. The IMF now wants us to do the reverse and do so in quite a drastic way. And you quote a table on revenue measures on page 12 of this report that VAT is going to be the champion of revenue increases over the medium term, much more so than corporate income taxes and mineral royalty tax. If I correctly get you, you're saying that what the mines and others through income and corporate tax will be paying will be far less than what... Everybody, because VAT is simply value-added tax on every basic good and commodity we're buying from the shelf. Correct. I mean, uh, what, what essentially means uh, is that we want to increase revenues, <clears throat> right? And the IMF is targeting an increase of about 3% of GDP over the next three years. And they want that majority of that 3%, 2.2% of that 3% should come from VAT. The rest should come from corporate income tax. I think it's like 0.2% and 0.1 percentage points from, uh, from mineral royalty taxes. So the burden of the increase in revenues will fall on VAT, which in, uh, 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 in, in inevitably falls on the poor. That's essentially One what's going on One other thing you, you talk about here is that uh, uh, it's funny for you that the IMF is concerned about the regressivity of fuel and electricity subsidies, yet they don't seem to worry about this same regressivity on VAT. But you go further to show concern that taxes on labor income are also likely to go up in the medium term and at a rate faster than taxes on profits. And you're talking about mining and nine mining. Let's, let's break that down. So there is a table that they have on, I think, page 35, if I remember correctly, that is showing projections uh, for, again, remember, they were tra trying to target revenue increases. Mm. They want to increase revenues from the from revenue authority, which in principle is a good idea. Again, we should always ask the question, Mr. Mansa, increase revenues from ZRA. Good question. The next mm. question is who's going to bear the burden of that increase? So when you look at that table on page 35, it projects increases <laughs> in corporate income taxes, mine and nine mining, as well as labor uh, taxes on labor, which is essentially pay as you earn, which is mostly our middle class, right? And when one sees that projection, you can see the rate of increase of collections from pay as you earn pay 
versus corporate income taxes, mines and unmines, that rate of increase from pay is much faster. Mm. Than, and already than this the ZRA have issued out a strong memo that effective October, uh, each you know person, uh, you know, uh, earning a salary must have their, you know, the TPIT. Correct. Attached to correct. The, as much as we we feel those are systems, but it is in a way saying we we, we must be able to capture everybody. That's true. I mean, in principle, that's a good thing. We all have to contribute to this enterprise, God's Zambia, right? Mm. Uh, but we always have to be careful how that burden of contribution is shared. We have a country that is endowed by God with minerals, and yet we are not looking at those minerals to be able to share this huge burden in revenue increases. Again, it is a recovery plan for whom? For the well-off. And uh, uh, a pain plan, uh, 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 a plan of pain for the poor. That is essentially the conclusion I draw, Mr. Mansa, from reading this particular document. Have we psychologically prepared, you know, the Zambians for what is yet to come? Because for me, um, the announcement of this 1.3 billion, you know, some, I mean, the government is even saying we should not call it a bailout. It's 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 an agreement. We're we're, we're going to pay back, but we've gone to town celebrating it. It's like it's a package that takes us to paradise. So many especially in the SME, many especially in the street, are now hopeful because those in front are celebrating. It's like all our problems are over. That's a good question. I mean, I, the reason why a lot of people are celebrating this is because they love their president. And uh, how do I know this? I mean, he was voted in overwhelmingly into office, a large margin into office. So a big chunk of our population loves and trusts our president. And that's a good thing. Uh, but, uh, I, but the plan which the government has anchored this recovery on is one that is, uh, that is terrible. And I think very soon our people will find out when these uh, increases begin to kick in, as they have to, because these are structural benchmarks. They're not non-negotiable. They're not things where you can call Kristalina Georgieva and say, oh, are we? But if you are Wakangiwa, we're failed. No, you'll have to meet them. Otherwise, the program is in jeopardy. If the program is in jeopardy, everything else becomes in jeopardy. So I, the question about have we psychologically prepared our people, Mr. Mansa? I mean, I'm not a politician, so I don't know. I'm but a humble academic. But one hopes that the government begins to communicate quite clearly and explain quite honestly uh, what's to come. So for scholars like yourselves, I mean, who've studied the IMF, you've been into South Africa, you're now in, in New York, what, was it really necessary? Was this the only way out for us as a country to go to the IMF? And I ask this on the backdrop, you talk about this as well, that there are some who are for and against the IMF that feel that I, the, the, there's nowhere in the world that an IMF program has benefited a borrowing country. What is your honest take about an IMF you know, program? And really, do the IMF mean well for Zambia? I mean, reading that document, Mr. Massa, there's no other way I can conclude but to say they don't mean well for the poor of Zambia. That's what I can conclude. And I'm filled with sorrow when I read it. it was, <coughs> it's ghastly. Uh, when you ask about what was the alternative, I have talked about that committee of Zambian experts. We really should have driven this process ourselves from the beginning. I wish the president had constituted a team of people quickly to consider options, one of which is go to the creditors themselves, figure out can we restructure, defer, Were well, these not cuts. the same people talking to the IMF in any case? Uh, it wasn't very transparent. I wish it had been transparently set up. I mean, we had maybe Lazard. I remember that was in the PF. I mean, the IMF document seems to suggest that Lazard might have continued a little bit in the early days of the New Dawn administration. Uh, but I wish that the president had put together a cross-cutting Because team. that's what the president boasts of, actually, that because this IMF deal has moved faster because of him putting up a team of patriotic and competent Zambians. I don't know who those people are, mm. aside from people in government. Mm. Again, this is a monumental problem of epic proportions that cannot be left to people in government alone. Mm. Certainly they should be part of such a team, but this team to allow for diversity of views, options, robust alternatives, needs to be cross-cutting. Have government folks there who are totally respect some of my best friends work at Ministry of Finance, have academics there from the University of Zambia, have people from the Central Bank, have people from the research world, have people from uh, investment banking. We have Zambians who work in investment banking at some of the highest levels, both locally and internationally, right? And then have some representatives for women, the youth, and so on and so forth on this team. Then you have a robust team 
that goes and engages with these creditors. What about the argument, basis? Doc? And I've heard this from government and the IMF themselves. Uh, you know, Kristalina Georgieva commends you know this administration over the recruitment of over forty thousand civil servants, uh, and and so those who argue that the IMF have restructured or, or, or rebranded say um, the previous IMF could not have allowed Zambia to put this consumptive move of, of, of hiring people. So with that, have they changed? You talk about issues of social cash transfer. They are promoting that and an increment. So there are people who feel the IMF have rebranded. I know they have not at all. I mean, uh, the evidence that we've been talking this couple of minutes and the evidence in the report, this drastic cut in expenditure that falls on the poor suggests this is the IMF of old. It's in their DNA. We have to remember why they were set up in anyways. It's in their DNA to do this kind of stuff. Uh, the hiring of teachers and health workers, incredibly laudable move. Mm. I'm really in awe of our president and our government for doing what they did. But we have to put that into context. Hardly financed by this special drawing rights allocation that I talked about uh, that, that luckily came in August 2021 uh, had nothing to do with President H. Lema but it had everything to do with the COVID pandemic. And the IMF decided to give all countries in the world special drawing rights in line with their quarters. And they could do with that money as they pleased. And like I said, if no strings attached, our president and his government does proper expenditure. But because of strings attached with this program, they are doing the reverse. It's out of their control. So this is not a reformed IMF. Had we not, if we didn't have COVID, those special drawing rights would never have come. I doubt it very much that uh, we would have hired these 40,000 public servants in the way that we did, which is incredibly commendable. I've seen some of the videos of these young people finding out that they've been hired. It is heartbreaking, hopeful, and incredibly encouraging. And I would like our government to do more of that. That is what our friend in the West do yeah. when they're having an economic crisis. They hire people, right? The, the famous British economist, Lord, uh, Lord Maynard Keynes, said, you actually hire people to dig up ditches and to bury them again because you're trying to get the economy to stimulate. In a similar you know, manner, I mean, I, I was saying last week when I hosted you know, Trevor Hambay, I said uh, it's like we, we move in circles. Uh, I remember when President you know, uh, Chiluba took over government in the 90s, we were sitting on a debt portfolio of around, I think, $7 billion, you know, dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Then we went into Structural Adjustment Program, or SAP, and HIPIC as it was, uh, and you could see the church then. I remember things like, you know, uh, 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 Jubilee Coalition and, and so on. I'm bringing this because as you sign off in your article, you said you'd like to address colleagues in the Zambian civil society who went along for the ride with the IMF, appeared in photo ops with the IMF staff, and largely gave credence to the OPEC process that gave birth to such an anti-poor deal. You go further to say, this, my friends, is on your hands and you went to sleep on the wheel when your role was historically, was and has historically been protecting the interests of the Zambian people. That's why I give that, you know, background. Has the church, have civil society failed us on this? Sadly, yes. I mean, they have been incredibly absent from this process when uh, President Ichilema announced that he would be seeking an IMF deal. Had expected my friends in uh, civil society to rally and mobilize on behalf of the poor, to really hold government to account, to really hold IMF to account, so that whatever conditions come out of this process, those conditions should not be anti-poor. But instead, what we did see was civil society actually arguing the loudest, got a megaphone and telling us, oh, the IMF has reformed, even taking pictures with people from the IMF. You know, I have, this is unheard of. Historically, you cited Jubilee De uh, Zambia campaign. Mm. The civil society of 30 years ago would have fought this and made sure that the, the, the poor people's interests were really protected. But we didn't see this with civil society this time around. They gave credence to this process. They gave it credibility. And it was so opaque. It lacked transparency. I mean, all we saw was IMF and then all of a sudden a deal. And I think I, I, I largely blame my colleagues in civil society. I have a lot of respect for them. They did a lot of work in the run-up to the elections, but they've sadly gone to sleep for one reason or the other. And I think I'm not the first person to call them out on uh, the fact that they've gone to sleep. And I think we need to see a reinvigorated civil society, one that does what civil society has always done, not to be in collision with uh, government, to be in collision with the poor, to be in collision with the everyday man and woman on the street, because those people can't speak for themselves. 
right? Civil society is supposed to do that important job. And sadly, in this particular moment, when we needed them the most, I think they let us down. In conclusion, Dr. Grieve Chenwa, for the Zambian, you know, watching out there and is asking them, yes, my government has inked this 1.3 billion loan agreement with the IMF. Is it gloom and doom? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? It's a difficult question, Mr. Mwansa. I mean, all things considered, it's going to be very difficult over the next three years or so. Very difficult. Again, very difficult for whom? For the poor and the less well-off. It's going to be very, very difficult. Is it doom and gloom? We're very resilient people. I mean, it's not also nice to, you know, to have to force the poor to be resilient. They also want to enjoy uh, life like everybody else. Uh, so, I mean, that's my, my hope is let us, uh, you know, it's been signed. What can we do? Um, let's hope for the best. Uh, you know, let's keep praying for this country that we all love. Let's hope for the best. And let's, uh, you know, let's, let's hope for the best. That's what I'm going to say. Thank you so much for talking to us tonight. Thanks for having me, Mr. Moise. It's been an absolute pleasure. Breaking down the deals and the detail in that 135-page document was released earlier this week on Tuesday somewhere around. If you haven't, you know, uh, looked at that copy, talks about the finer details of what, uh, you know, this IMF package means for Zambia. And obviously, some proposed removal of subsidies on uh, fuel price uh, on, on, on fuel commodities as well as uh, electricity tariffs and obviously other tax components. Discussing this obviously was Dr. Grief Chiwa, his director of research at the Institute on Race, Power, and Political Economy at the New York at the New School rather. Uh, of New York City. Uh, thank you so much. Remember, you can catch this exclusive interview. It's at Diamond TV Zambia on YouTube as well as a repeat session on 271. That is DSTV. Good night and God bless. was brought to you by FQM Trident Limited, a subsidiary of First Quantum Minerals Limited.